worse. He's mad. I do so love custard. Or was it mustard? We removed your brain. Do you comprehend, commie animal? Get your act together. You're making us look like a collection of round earthers. Vivisect me, please. You think I don't know? I'm crazy. I sound the place I do. They hate me just to torture me. The things you do with our body are suicidally dangerous. You're a monster. A deranged monster. In our last episode, we confronted Dr. Mobius. We learned that Dr. Mobius erected the radar fence around the crater and installed recursive programming in the brains of all of the think tank scientists to keep them occupied so that they don't escape the crater and unleash the same kind of horrors that we have discovered in every episode of this series upon the Mojave. Dr. Mobius was trying to protect the Mojave. After deciding how to deal with Dr. Mobius, we now have to go confront the think tank. But before we do, we need to retrieve our brain. Well, well, look who finally dragged themselves in out of the wasteland. And where have we been, hmm? Crawling through pits of radioactive muck again? Are you my brain? Ah, lovely. Figure that out, have we? Would you like a cookie? If we have extremely low intelligence, at the very beginning here, we get a unique dialogue tree. We can say, actually, yes, I would like a cookie. I... Uh, is this really what I have to look forward to? Cool, I can talk to my own brain. Can my heart and spine talk too? Uh, yes. Well, you do know that those particular organs don't have neurons and are thus incapable of speech. Yes? Oh, man, you talk a lot of science, brain, but you don't make a lot of sense. <sighs> Very well. Let me put this in terms you'll understand. Brain, smart. Heart, stupid. Spine, very stupid. You? Exceptionally stupid. Does that explain the matter? Well, you don't have a mouth, but you can talk. Explain that, smarty pants. I don't have... Ugh. I have an inferior frontal gyrus wired directly into a speech synthesizing processor. Your heart can't be wired up to a, a thought synthesizing processor! You can't talk to it! Ooh, what about my spine? Uh, Brain? You seem awful smart all of a sudden. <laughs> I've been bettering myself, I'll have you know. I've been reading. Actual literature, mind you. Not that La Fontaine or Tales of Chivalry drivel. I've been studying the classics, acquiring a solid grounding in medicine and the sciences. Also, I'm fairly certain this tank has been liberally salted with ground mentats. All this smart talk is hurting my brain. Please stop it. Well, we certainly wouldn't want to strain your comprehension, would we? But if our intelligence is average or above average, we can start this conversation by pointing out something rather strange. My courier is a woman. Why then does her brain sound so... masculine? Ah, well, as to that, you'd be surprised how hard a feminine-sounding voice modulator is to find in the Forbidden Zone. It's not as though brain-sustaining life support tanks grow on trees. I had to take what I could get. There's no need to be sarcastic. Meeting your own brain is a slightly odd event. Yes, well, believe me, the opposite is equally true. Good lord, have you bathed at all since they pulled me out of you? Yes, because after running around a crater filled with bizarre science experiments, personal hygiene is a top priority. Well, I see sarcasm hasn't eluded you. Fine, perhaps now isn't the best time, but it's the principle of the thing. What about you? That tank isn't exactly looking springtime fresh. Well, I... well... That's a completely different matter. The tank isn't biological, it's not the same at all. Look, I've been busy. Oh yes, I rather expect you have. You must have been swamped, you poor dear. Why don't you relax and put your feet up? I've just been traumatically scooped out of my body and plugged into this jar. That's all. But you've been busy. Why are you such a dick? Well, that's a fine how do you do. Me, a, quote, dick, unquote, 
As if I'm the one responsible for the way you carry on gadding about the wastes. I'm not the one that makes us clamber around technus infested ancient vaults or go charging off to New Vegas on missions of ill-conceived revenge. And have we forgotten who got us shot in the head and buried in a shallow grave? Hmm? Do you think I enjoy that little moment? Oh, come on, that stuff's fun! Fun? Fun? Is tetanus fun? Hmm? Is rickets? What about Celsius, huh? Enjoy that, do we? The things you do with our body are suicidally dangerous, and if you could silence your glandular impulses, you would hear me screaming at you! Well, I didn't realize it caused you so much distress. Well, maybe next time you hear me telling you that charging a nightkin with a penknife is a bad idea, you'll listen. Look, you're responsible for all of this. The vault exploring, the revenge. After all, you are my brain. I most certainly am not. I'm the seat of all reason and logic in our little partnership. All those feelings that motivate you, that sense of righteousness and that rush you get when you help someone, do you know where those come from? Glands. They come from glands. Free of the tyranny of your ape-like and primitive endocrine system, I can see how foolish your motives are. We can then pass a medicine check of 55 to say, but you're the source of most of those glands. Unless you're trying to argue that my thyroid is to blame. I, well, look, it's all a very complex system of biofeedback and other things I wouldn't expect you to understand. Admit it, brain. You're just as glandular as I am. Oh, all right. Perhaps I am, but at least I'm logical about it. All right, listen. I'm starting to get fed up with this conversation. You're my brain, so you better be more respectful. Oh, had I? What exactly will you do if I don't? Not put me back in that cranial dungeon you call your head? Heavens forbid. I could smash this tank you're in. How about that? By all means, if the idea of spending the rest of your days as a true lobotomite appeals to you. Actually, come to think of it, you probably wouldn't mind that, would you? Or once you're back in my head... I'll watch television. Lots. And lots of television. You... you wouldn't. That's inhuman. I would. And I'd follow it up with an alcohol and ant nectar cocktail every night. You're a monster. A deranged, self-destructive monster! Well, maybe I'm not being serious, but I got your attention, didn't I? I suppose it did. Bravo. You've managed to intimidate the brain in a jar. Look, seriously, Brain, don't tempt me. Fine. I'll try to respect you more, ma'am. So how on earth did Mobius get a hold of my brain anyway? After the think tank extracted me from your skull, they fell to bickering amongst themselves. I'm sad to say we were quite forgotten about. Dr. Mobius saw an opportunity to gain some leverage and had me spirited away to his dome. How did he manage that? I don't know. I'm afraid the trauma of our separation rendered me quite insensate. I didn't come around until I was safely ensconced in this tank. I'm quite sure whatever he did was highly scientific, though. That seems like a pretty unlikely coincidence. Hardly. Dr. Mobius keeps a close optical sensor on the goings-on at the think tank. As soon as he saw the opportunity, he took it. Well, that answers that. Well, as long as your curiosity is satisfied. Don't you want to be reunited? I thought you'd be happy to get back into my head. I'm not going to lie to you. The prospect is definitely not that appealing. Look at it from my perspective. Here I have peace, quiet, and safety. Well, barring the odd rogue scorpion. In your head, I've got poison, radiation, grisly injuries, and biological functions. Do you know how much more you can get done when you're not constantly looking for places to urinate? It's quite a lot, I can tell you. Why did you never say anything about how you felt before? What did you think all those self-preservation instincts were, hmm? All those times you thought for a fleeting second, maybe I shouldn't punch that death claw in the face. That was me telling you exactly how I felt before! Well, too bad, Brain. I've got arms and you don't. You're coming with me. I can see there's going to be no reasoning with you at all, is there? 
I'm nothing more than a slave to your deranged glandular whims. Well, look, if you like being stuck in there so much, maybe I'll just leave you. Oh no, please don't leave me here in this nice, safe dome where I have access to nutritive fluids and a fully indexed library. Please don't deprive me of being dragged through a landscape so bleak it was actually improved by the end of the world. I don't know how I could bear it. Fine, you can stay here. Not like I need this hassle. Oh no, you don't need this hassle. You're too busy treating your body like a canvas of sucking flesh wounds to deal with your brain. Okay then, I'm going. Good, go! I will! Fine! Great! I know it's great! Look, Brain, think about what happened to the Think Tank. Do you want to end up like them after a few hundred years? It's true. The Brains here have experienced some degree of... deterioration. I'm confident that with a few decades of work, I can solve the problem. We can then pass a 75 science check to say, then surely you've taken into account the corrosive effects of long-term exposure to biogel. Of course I accounted for that! Do you think I'm so stupid? No, you're right. Maintaining my current functionality will be harder than I thought. This bears some further looking into. What exactly would happen to me if I left you here? Hmm, let me see. I suppose you'd continue on much as you are now, using that synthetic thinking machine to do the heavy lifting. Unless, of course, the batteries run out. But that seems unlikely. And if I put you back? I'm not entirely sure. I suppose there's a chance that the reintegration would create some improved synergy between us. What form that might take, though, I cannot say. Well, I can see your point. I guess I can understand why you don't want to leave that jar. But what can I do to make this a fair compromise? If you want me back, we need to establish some ground rules. First, showers! Second, regular checkups. Regular, mind you, and from a reputable doctor. That Julie Farkas woman, for example, she seems to know a thing or two. Third, you need to listen to me more than your hormonal choir and genitalian orchestra. Promise me that, and you've got a deal. Okay, fine, you got a deal. Really? Hm. I didn't expect you to actually agree to that. I'm afraid that was a bit of a bluff, really. I'm not going with you. What? So you'd rather just stay here, never leaving that tank of whatever that stuff is? Well, certainly there might be some things I miss about being ambulatory. We have seen some incredible sights, haven't we? Jason Bright and his followers launching into the vast unknown. Helios One coming back online. But still, given the tremendous, potentially life-ending peril that went along with those... Yes, yes, I'd rather stay here. But what about the good things? What about a cool breeze on your cheek? The smell of food? Love. Overrated biological feedback. Believe me, you only feel that way because you've got all that meat oozing hormones. We can then pass a 75 speech check to say, isn't it just as true that you only feel this way because you're lacking those hormones? Hmm, I suppose you're right. That does call certain assumptions into question, doesn't it? Yeah, I bet you didn't think of that, did you? Yes, yes, all right, bravo. You've come up with something I neglected to consider. There'll be no living with you now. So, what do we do about this? So we're at an impasse. You can't feel what I feel, and I can't think the way you think. Indeed, quite the conundrum. How do you suppose we resolve it? The dialogue tree then splits into two directions. We can first go down a path where the brain stays in his jar by saying, well, maybe we could keep going like this. What do you think? You mean I'll stay in my tank and you'll stay in your skin? And we'll each handle our own areas of expertise? Hm. I certainly like the sound of that. Maybe I have been a little unfair. If you want to stay here, I'll let you. Uh, it's not that I didn't like being in your head, you understand. As far as heads go, it was a rather nice one. Well then, I suppose this is goodbye for now. What will you do? Well, maybe I'll explore Big Mountain more before I go back to the think tank. Will you take some free advice from your brain? Don't trust the think tank. They are right. In the brain, I mean.
They're fiercely protective of their technology, and none of them is likely to share it willingly. But I could always go back to the think tank and get them to let me out. They promised to do that much. And you believe them? Really? I know you were recently deprived of my fabulous advice, but... Really? Once I'm delivered into their clutches, they'll find a way past the radar fence and the whole Mojave will be their playground. And that is assuming, of course, that one of them doesn't take a fancy to our body and decide to slip his own brain into it instead. What's so bad about letting the brains get out? They don't seem that terrible. Don't seem so bad. They vivisected us just to see what would happen. Have you forgotten the lobotomites? The cyber dogs, I assume you saw those. Imagine that kind of science spread across the entire Mojave. Every man, woman, and child we've met reduced to a lobotomite. Is that what you want? We can then pass a 75 speech check to say, Brain, you're part of me. I know you don't want to let that happen any more than I do. Well, I suppose I do miss those endorphin rushes when we save the day. All right, what's the plan? Or, at the dialogue tree split, we could instead try to convince the brain to rejoin our body by saying, I think we have to trust each other and acknowledge that we aren't complete if we're separated. I suppose there might be some advantage to that, yes. There's a chance that the reintegration would create some improved synergy between us. So, what do you say, Brain? Join me for some more wild adventures? Well, I suppose you've convinced me well enough. I'll rejoin your body if that's your final decision. Unfortunately, before we get to that stage of the proceedings, we have a problem. Even if I could settle myself back in your skull and reconnect all those pesky nerve endings, Dr. Mobius doesn't have the tools here. We would have to make use of Dr. Klein's lab, and I rather doubt the brains are inclined to share. Then let's go make them share. Come on, brain, it's stomping time. Oh, lovely. We've reached the mindless violence portion of the program. Tell me, what exactly are you, and I use the word loosely, planning? We can then pass a variety of skill checks to convince the brain to tag along, each of which garners a different response from the brain. We can pass a guns check of 75 to say, I'm going to give them a demonstration of the physics behind small, fast-moving chunks of lead. Hmm. Now that you mention it, I do miss that lovely rat a tat boom a bit. It's just not the same without a body to feel recoil. What's the next step, then? Or we can pass an energy weapon skill check of 75 to say, I'm going to show them what's really the brightest thing in the room. Oh, energy weapons. Yes, I'd almost forgotten how much fun those are. How do we proceed then? Or an explosives check of 75 to say, ever had a squirrel brain omelet? That, but on a bigger scale and with bombs. Well, you have always been thorough in your destruction. All right, what's your plan? Or a melee check of 75 to say, the brains have forgotten the little things. Things like sharp blades and heavy chunks of steel. Going the old-fashioned route, are we? I rather like it. What's next? Or an unarmed check of 75 to say, I'm going to show them even a video screen can get a black eye. Not much of one for the high-tech approach, are we? Well, I suppose we'd best get on with it. Or, if none of our combat skills are high enough to pass any of these checks, we can continue by saying, let's just say violence is the last resort of the civilized man. And I'm feeling mighty uncivilized. With an attitude like that, it's small wonder you got yourself shot in the head. Brain, what's it going to take to convince you? I'd like to find a nice little place to live, maybe in Good Springs, and settle down where we won't get shot at. Not as often, at any rate. Come on, we have a duty to the wasteland. We have got to get out of here. There go those glands again. Is the endorphin rush you get from doing the right thing really that good? I'm not spending the rest of my life here when there's a whole world to loot. Ah, yes, there's that greed and general sense of malice. I'd nearly forgotten it. What's the plan, then? Now, regardless of which way we went at that dialogue tree split, we come back to this final decision. Here, we choose whether or not to leave our brain in the jar. Now, we can always change our mind later, but the choice we make here does affect the ending that we get. We can convince the brain to stay by saying, I'll handle the brains. You stay here. You'll be more useful outside my head. 
That arrangement suits me fine. Do try not to get too many holes drilled in your head, will you? I may want to drop by for sentimental reasons. Right then. You'd best be off, hadn't you? The think tank will be waiting. No, don't worry about me. When you're gone, I'll flush myself over to the sink. It's amazing how far you can get in this place with a good flush. I'll keep myself hidden in the ductwork. Klein won't suspect I'm inside the dome, so he won't know the pacification field no longer works on us. I can also upgrade the sink's autodock with the procedures to reinstall your heart and spine, assuming you want all that flesh and gristle back. With any luck, I'll see you in the sink when this is all over. In which case we earn the achievement, make up your mind, and the brain heads on over to the sink. Or we can convince him to come with us by saying, if the think tank won't hold up their bargain, we'll make them. Let's go. Right. Look out, think tank. This brain is coming out of its jar. I suppose now that we're reunited, you'll want to fill your torso up with those other meaty parts the think tank took from us. Personally, I think your upgrades are quite a bit better. But now that I'm with you, the Sinks Autodoc can plug them back in no problem. Right then, off we go. Clyde will be in for a nasty shock when he realizes the pacification field won't work on a mind and body reunited. In which case the brain joins us as an inventory item. We find him in the miscellaneous section of our inventory. We must now confront the think tank, but before we do, we can explore Dr. Mobius's forbidden dome. Lying on a table with a bunch of books and a microscope, we find the unique weapon, Dr. Mobius's glove. Dr. Mobius's glove looks like any other scientist glove, except that it's pitch black and it has a tiny skull inside the hexagon. It's the second most powerful scientist glove, coming in at 28 damage just behind Dr. Klein's of 34, giving it a DPS of 38.2. However, it has a unique effect. On critical strikes, we have the option to both knock back an enemy and cause that enemy to frenzy. When frenzied, enemies will attack each other. If used correctly, not the way I'm using it here, this glove is a great crowd control device. If you land a critical on a number of enemies, they can fight each other while you switch to your primary weapon. We see evidence that Dr. Mobius has tried to put his brain in a mobile body in the past. We find the chassis of a robo-brain lying next to two tables. On one, we find a copy of Fixin' Things. Like the think tank, the Forbidden Dome has a number of different rooms. Most of these are filled with randomized loot. Lots of containers to explore. In one, we find a small library with a piece of Psycho on the ground, likely some of the Psycho Dr. Mobius used to amp himself up before sending those threatening broadcasts. In the next one, we find some drained microfusion cells on a console and more containers. In the next one, we find Mentats on the ground, microfusion cells in a cabinet, and a layer leaning against a wall next to an ammo crate. In the next room on the other side of our brain, we find more filing cabinets with some scientist scrubs and psycho on the ground. And in the next one, we find quite a haul indeed, a whole slew of mentats on the ground. This must be Dr. Mobius's private mentats stash. The final room just has random containers. Back out and heading down, we find one table with five ammunition boxes on top. And in a trunk to the northwest, we find Dr. Mobius's scrubs. These are a unique version of the scientist scrubs and are better than both the mad scientist scrubs and Dr. Klein's scrubs. These not only look different, these are red instead of green, blue, or white, and they have much better stats. It only has six DT, but it grants plus one charisma, plus two intelligence, and a whopping plus 15 science. This is the last piece to Dr. Mobius's three-part scientist outfit. If we equip all three at the same time, we complete the challenge Mobius Strip and gain around 100 experience. Before heading to the think tank, we can take Dr. Mobius aside and tell him our brain's decision. Oh, I see you and your brain reached a compromise. How pleasant. I hypothesize after the indignant frequencies my receptors had uh, recepted, such a partnership-based conclusion would be low on the likely scale. My brain told me the think tank needs to be stopped. Can you help? If I recall, I had a plan that was working, uh, whatever it was. I don't think it reached fruition. I would recall fruit if it had happened. 
I wasn't trying to kill them, just keep them out of trouble. What was that plan? Blast! I probably uh, wrote it down on the floor somewhere. What was the plan you had? Something ingenious and needlessly complicated, I expect. I may have already told you and forgotten it. I forgot I had forgotten pencils until one day I found one. Spent days studying its purpose before my memory circuit kicked in. Felt quite silly. Any tactics I could use to attack the think tank? That will be difficult. It would be like fighting five scaled-down versions of me that have better depth perception. And they have an arsenal of vivisectors, brain eel beams, and a rather nasty ray that can make your atoms do a happy dance. If you could survive those highly improbable odds and ends, then deceasing them is definitely an option. Although, I doubt killing them would do anything except make you feel better. Or let you brag to other humans about your primal violentness. Is there anything I could do to stop them that doesn't require violence? Well, you could try and appeal to their humanity. <laughs> That's a tired cliché. And really, when they were humans, they weren't very good humans. Any suggestions for how to make them change their minds? Well, there's many things they have forgotten sitting in their bowls. Friendship, the thrill of discovery, love, masturbation, the usual. Much like your brain, I am certain there is something you can spark within each of them. Memories, hormones. A wise man once said, the eyes do more than see. Make them see, if you can. Or if not, you can always make them succumb to fear. <laughs> it certainly worked for me, for a time. Then you came along, and bravery and or desperation trumped that little idea. Back to the drawing board, I suppose. Or is this the end? Hard to tell. Scare them? How? Oh, tell them I'm still alive. We had a nice chat, and we agree on a few things. That's true, isn't it? Or you could kill me and lie about it. Either way, it would be interesting. And if you are partial to lying and deception, well, you could tell them a ludicrous lie. The more over the top, the better. That's my experience. They're more than a little gullible. Better make it convincing, though. Or it'll be the dissection table and vivisectors for you. And if you speak of me, please try and make me look good. I am Dr. Mobius, after all. Not some lab assistant teacher's aide. Well, I'd really, really like to kill them. <sighs> Well, if you're determined to go down that road, so be it. They will undoubtedly switch off the pacification field when you return. After getting Dr. Mobius's advice, we can turn around and exit the Forbidden Dome. When we arrive at the think tank, we get a notice. Dr. Klein awaits. Make sure you're prepared to finish this once and for all. Continuing forward, we see that the lighting scheme of the think tank has changed. The lights now glow an ominous red. The lobotomite returns. Our lobotomite. Has Dr. Mobius been denominated into scrap metal and voice module parts as we hoped? We recall that our brain held the key to turning off the pacification field. That was the only thing keeping us from violence. We always have the opportunity to start this conversation by saying, you may have noticed the pacification field is down. Guess what happens now? A fight? I, I've never been in a fight. What, uh, what, what, what do I... Ah, colleagues! Think tank! Alert! Alert! We are under attack! In which case, all members of the think tank turn hostile. 
They have very powerful mind and laser attacks. They managed to whittle me down below half within moments of the fight starting. Thankfully, they have this strange reload mechanism whereby their tank turns around while they move, preventing them from firing. Also, I've noticed that even though their lasers shoot very quickly, the mind blasts are really slow. I was able to kill them my first try using Elijah's Lair, which shoots really quickly for a rifle, though I walked away with only a sliver of health remaining. On their corpses, we find quite a lot of ammunition and scrap. Dr. Eight has a copy of Meeting People, and Dr. Dalla has a teddy bear, of course. But let's say we want to resolve things a little bit more diplomatically. Now, the game gives us many options to fight them. If we choose either of the bottom two, we initiate combat. The only way to avoid combat is to say, I found my brain, now you and I are going to settle things. I recommend watching your tone with me, Lobotomite. Now, your brain. Hand it over, or we'll extract it again. I am not handing my brain over. There are still some things we need to discuss. And what could we possibly have to speak about? You have the brain, we have the technology. All you must do is surrender. With it, we can finally leave this place. I cannot tell you how boring this place gets, chopping up the landscape and everything in it. And we have so many questions to ask your brain first. About this Mojave place. A fertile testing ground for our experiments. Now at this point, we have a number of ways to resolve this, depending upon the choices we've made in the game. We could take Mobius's advice and intimidate the think tank by passing a 75 speech check to lie. We can say, you think I am the Lobotomite? No, for my skull houses the brain of Mobius. That is the most insane thing I've ever heard. There's no way Mobius would condescend to step inside you. Besides, there's no way such a thing could be accomplished. It's impossible. To convince him, we have to pass either a 100 science check or an 85 medicine check. If successful, Dr. Klein has the same response. We can say, nothing is impossible for science. Mesons, lasers, atoms, brain waves, all are at my command. Or, countless brain extraction surgeries exist, but only one implantation one, from Mobius. You speak the truth, and the decibel variation in your voice, it is Mobius. How dare you breach the sink tank, and what do you want here? Heh, <laughs> er, ahem, <clears throat> I offer a deal. Stay here, stay put, and he'll, I'll let you live. That's no deal at all. There's a whole world beyond the crater filled with ideas and possibilities. We could have escaped, seen it all for ourselves, tested it, prodded at it, made it squirm. I will permit you to do this for me. Partner with you, my foe, my rival, my foremost critic? I have a strange sensation that I would like that. How odd. Very well, partner. The think tank is at your service as long as you do not destroy us. And with that, the think tank scientists lose all interest in escaping Big Mountain. We have another option to intimidate Klein if we've killed Dr. Mobius. In that case, we find an option to lie and say, do you think I killed Mobius? No, he lives. You must have killed him. He wouldn't have just let you walk in, take your brain, would he? No, something is wrong. Your perspiration, heartbeat, all tell a different story, I think. We can then pass an 85 speech check to say, you fools had best listen, or Mobius will bring his army here to sting you stupid. That sounds like something Mobius would say. How dare you breach the think tank? And what do you want here? In which case we find the same option to offer a deal. They stay here, they stay put, and Mobius will let them live. That's no deal at all. 
Or if we don't like the idea of intimidating these guys, we can instead say, Mobius and I talked it over, reached an understanding. You are lying. No, you are not. Your heartbeat, perspiration, all excessively confident and sure of yourself. Why would you reason with that maniac? He'll destroy us all! I can't let you dissect the Mojave, nor can I let you leave. Yes, you can. You don't really have an alternative that I can see. This next option only works if we completed each of the Think Tank scientists' personal quests, allowing Dala to woo at us, convincing Dr. O to put a slash through his name so that everyone realizes he's zero, telling Dr. Eight that there's no need to be ashamed about his sonic needs, and helping Dr. Boris come to terms with the fate of his beloved pet, Gabe. If we only helped out one or two of the doctors with their issues, then at this point we're forced to fight them all. But if we helped out three or more of the doctors with their issues, then when we say, maybe you should confer with your colleagues first, we hear the following. Nonsense! Confer? Colleagues? Those are two words I do not recognize. Dr. Klein, I must intersect. Please, do not harm the lobotomite. I'm not going to harm it. I'm going to dissect it until it's dead. Why the sudden intersection, Dollar? I cannot stand a breathing, a sweet breathing organism breathing in and out to suddenly not breathe. We must keep it alive for study. A slow study. Dollar, these vocalized pauses are... Unlike you. What do you care? Fine, uh, you know, this lobotomite, it's a great sounding board. You respect ideology, right? This one's, well, it's got good ideas. Silence, Doctor. Oh, this is a think tank decision. Save your objections until after I have decided our course of action. You know what, Klein? Stick a straw in your tank and suck yourself. Long and deep. And my name is Zero. Yeah, a big, fat Zero with a slash through it. The slash as a designator of... Why, that is brilliant. But how did you... The lobotomite taught me that. Taught me a name is more than, um... <laughs> that I should take pride in things like names. And... You know what? Forget it, Klein. I hate you! And your theory of Bringle Beam Oscillation? The Chinese had it first, you copycat! How dare you! Bringle Beam Oscillation was solely my discovery! I expressly told you that and deleted all evidence to the contrary! <laughs> it's two, eight... Why are you acting like this? You've never refused to commit necessary surgery before. And this lobotomite needs its surgery. A noble speech, but there is no room in my vocabulators for friend and lobotomite in the same sentence. The very concept! <laughs> Revolting. Perhaps you are irradiated with camaraderie radiation. We have chems for that. We can save you from your emotional addiction. If I may, I feel as if I must be the voice of reason here. This lobotomite is much like us. Regarding even animals and pets is nothing more than avenues to promote science. There is good here. Instead of ending its life on the table, we should prolong its suffering in the name of science. Like good old Gabe, the finest of lab specimens. Why am I even listening to you fools? Enough of this mutinous chorus. If there's a word I hate, it's mutiny. And the word jism, which never made any sense to me. It's ridiculous putting j and zm together like that. Nonsense! I count as five, 
Like the mighty human hand I once had, with its five penises clenched in a fist. Sounds to me like your math is wrong, and the odds aren't in your favor. Nonsense! The mathematics of this situation are on our side, Lobotomite. I believe... No, wait. Hmm. Carry the two, then... Hmm. If this were a democracy, I would be concerned. We are too scientific for that. So just surrender. It's not a democracy. It's a research facility. And over half of your colleagues dispute your findings. You dare use logic against me? I do. Here's the deal. I'm not going to surrender. You are. That's no deal at all. There's a whole world beyond the crater, filled with ideas and possibilities. We could have escaped, seen it all for ourselves, tested it, prodded at it, made it squirm. We have two options to end this, both of which get the same response from Dr. Klein. We can convince him that he can still see the outside world, test it, prod it, but to do so from here, quietly, and for the courier. Or we can offer to bring the Mojave to Dr. Klein, possibly in the form of stories, observations, maybe even samples for the think tank to experiment upon. But the think tank itself will stay here in the crater, safe and sound, but still able to experiment. For you? And for science? I have a strange sensation that I would like that. How odd. Very well, partner. The think tank is at your service as long as you do not destroy us. In which case we become partners with the think tank, and we spare the Mojave from suffering from their soulless experiments. If we choose to resolve things peacefully, almost every character we have met has something to say. Thank you for what you have done. The helping, that is. We like that. I feel an odd emotion. Gratitude? Attitude? No, wait. Gratitude, that's it. The teddy bear lobotomite returns. My teddy bear. How can I assist in relieving your curiosity? Dr. Dalla remains a steady source of drained energy cells, as long as we come by once a day so that she can woo at us. So is Mobius as twisted as he looked in person? Can't believe you entered the Forbidden Zone and lived. None of us can. Dr. O will still occasionally find spare caps cluttering up his monitors. You're welcome, Eight. It was my pleasure. And Dr. Eight remains a steady source of microfusion cells and skill magazines. La Fantoma or Tales of Chivalry, depending upon our choices earlier in the game. The Lobotomite who saved us. Hello. And once a day, we can get Cazador poison glands, Night Stalker blood, or Cazador eggs from Dr. Boris. When at last we leave the think tank, we get our personalized game ending. As it had been in the years before the Great War, Big Mountain, the Big Empty, became home to one of the brightest minds of the 23rd century. If we complete the DLC with bad karma, the courier who had been brought to the Big Empty became its new overlord, using its facilities ruthlessly and decisively when needed. Sometimes, science is more than a quest for discovery. It is a weapon to be used in the service of one with the strength to understand it. But if we complete the DLC with good or neutral karma... The courier watched over the Big Empty for years to come, caring for it, and keeping its discoveries safe until they were needed to help others. Which had always been Big Mountain's purpose. Past the laboratories and science, it had always been intended as a place to build the future of all mankind. And if we discovered fewer than ten locations... Although, truth be told, the courier had barely explored the crater in an attempt to rush through and be done with the whole thing. Perhaps that was for the best, however. Curiosity, while sometimes rewarded for its efforts, often proves to be equally dangerous. But if we discovered between 10 to 25 locations... The courier had scoured much of the big empty, 
all those secrets still remained in the crater's depths. Perhaps that was for the best, however. Curiosity, while sometimes rewarded for its efforts, often proves to be equally dangerous. And if we discovered more than 25 locations... The SYNC Central Intelligence Unit was impressed by the amount of exploration the courier had undertaken. Facilities believed lost, destroyed, or ones that had simply gotten up and walked to new locations had been rediscovered by its intrepid new master. Internally, the artificial personality debated as to whether it preferred the old management to the new, and concluded that the courier's thorough approach to research and investigation was admirable and worthy of its respect. If we decided to kill Dr. Mobius... The Forbidden Zone continued to be, true to its name, forbidden. No more robo-scorpions were sighted in its canyons. Big Mountain became even emptier, devoid of Dr. Mobius's proclamations forecasting the destruction of anything that dared possess sentience. Still, it is said he lived on in the equations inscribed on the floor and walls of the Forbidden Zone Dome. And if we did so with good or neutral karma... A cobweb tracery of symbols that told of a thousand brilliant thoughts, now lost to time. Or if we did so with bad karma... But these equations were nothing more than thin white traceries of lines, not unlike cobwebs in the corners of a failing mind. But if we chose to keep Dr. Mobius alive... Dr. Mobius continued his research undisturbed in the Forbidden Zone. As much as he had attempted to create better scorpions, he tried the same with humanity with considerably less success. These failures didn't bother him over much. Once the rush of Mentats wore off, he forgot he had failed in any event. After all, the bright young mind who had come to visit him in the Forbidden Zone had already exceeded his expectations. If we only installed the SYNC Central Intelligence Unit... The SYNC was strangely silent which it had never been in previous years. The lack of personality modules made the base lifeless and sterile. But if we discovered and installed between two to four other artificial intelligences... The sink atop the dome gained a frontier town feel with the few modules installed. They shouted at each other across the HQ occasionally, either threatening each other or announcing a discovery. It kept things lively. Secretly, the SYNC Central Intelligence Unit was relieved that not all of the personality chips had been found. What was there was enough. But if we discovered five or more SYNC artificial intelligences... The SYNC atop the dome bustled with the voices of a small town, constantly chirping, arguing, and snarling at each other. Still, this all happened productively in the interests of its new owner. The SYNC Central Intelligence Unit discovered, despite its inversion code, it was comforted by the sense of community the other personalities gave it. If we did not complete the optional tasks inside the X-8 facility, we get the following ending. As the courier made his way through the X-8 facility, the computers analyzed the test subject's movements. They eventually created new cyber dogs to root out commie traitors from the wasteland. Traitors like Betsy Bright, Richie Marcus. Although they couldn't seem to find any commies, so they turned on themselves, howling sonic barks that echoed miles across the landscape. But if we completed the main quest and all optional quests... As the courier ran through the X-8 facility multiple times, the computers analyzed the test subject's movements. Rather than performing a superficial observation, they realized the subject barely knew what communism was, or even what a high school was. This confused them for a time, until the facility finally realized that its research had... succeeded. So it let its cyber dogs out into the wastes to help protect small communities from physical aggression rather than communist propaganda. 
if we did not complete all of the optional stealth tests inside X-13, we learn the following. The infiltration program in X-13 continued to scan for the subject and the stealth suit prototype long after the test was over. Frustrated and unable to find its lost technology, X-13 expanded its network of laser tripwires, sensors, and robo-brains out across Big Mountain. This glittering blue light beam forest cleanly bisected anything that entered its depths, slicing them into small segmented parts for easy disposal. But if we completed all of the optional stealth tests, we get the following ending. The infiltration program in X-13 felt spent, having repeatedly upgraded the stealth suit until it could upgrade it no more. It felt warm, fulfilled, and a bit sluggish, it realized not long after, the stealth suit had left it without so much as a note on the nightstand. So the infiltration program sent out robo-brains into the wastes, looking for its wayward technology. It eventually found Repcon HQ and set up a new research center, testing and murdering fiends who kept breaking into the facility. If, while exploring X-8, we create the cybernetic dog Roxy, we learn the following. The cybernetic canine, gender female, designation Roxy, sat in her guard post in X-8. That is, until her I'm in heat programming circumvented her stay routine and she loped into the Mojave. If the cyberdog Rex is dead, we learn that there Roxy ran across the corpse of Rex. She dragged him back to the Big Empty and had him rebuilt for company. The two of them constructed a litter of cyber pups, a small army of Boston Terriers that gnawed and devoured anything in their path. Or if Rex is alive, but we never turned him into a companion, we learn that Roxy ran across Rex at the King's School of Impersonation. His brain was failing, but that was all right. He was still smarter than the think tank. Together, the two of them constructed a litter of cyber pups. But if Rex is alive and he's a companion, we learn that Roxy ran across Rex, who had been following the courier just as she had. They barked for a while and realized they had a lot in common. Then together, the two of them constructed a litter of cyber pups. If we chose to leave our brain, we learn the following. The courier left the brain at the big empty. A strange thing to say, but it was the truth. Brains are less important than they may seem. When the courier's body finally passed, the brain was saddened. It kept on, remembering the vessel that had once contained it. And if we had bad karma... And so it burbled and bubbled inside its tank, smug that it still could dream its future without glands getting in the way. In time, however, it became so self-obsessed, it wondered if perhaps nothing existed except itself. It decided to test this by turning the weapons of the Big Empty against each other and seeing what happened. The answer is lost to history, as is much of the Mojave. But if we had good karma... Even at the end, when it started to fail, however, the brain resisted going into a floating chassis like the think tank. It never said why. Perhaps it was out of respect for the courier's body. All things must come to an end, and to hang on to the past is something that's not to be undertaken lightly. Or if we chose to put our brain back in our skull... The courier, organs intact, continued onwards, a little less heavy of step, but with all the organs in the right places, as they should be. After all, brains can develop a life of their own when left to their own thoughts, and the courier's brain was more clever than most. If we chose to kill the think tank... The think tank basement, filled with lobotomized robotical frames of the doctors, now served as a graveyard. The monitors had recorded the battle in its entirety including the think tank's final shrill, terrified screams, whimpers, and pleas for mercy. They broadcast these humiliating last moments as a warning to anyone approaching the perimeter that other smarty pants were not welcome. The courier was the inheritor of the big empty, and there was room for only one will 
in the halls of the Think Tank Dome. But if we chose to keep them alive... Dr. Klein and the Think Tank remained alive, unaware of the world outside. They looped through their daily routine, none the wiser about the world beyond. Although perhaps wiser was the wrong word. The world outside belonged to the Courier. And if anyone would shape it, well, the Courier had already called dibs. There is an expression in the wasteland, Old World Blues. It refers to those so obsessed with the past, they can't see the present, much less the future, for what it is. They stare into the what was, eyes like pilot lights, guttering and spent, as the realities of their world continue on around them. Science is a long, steady progression into the future. What may seem a sudden event often isn't felt for years, even centuries to come. If we complete the DLC with bad karma, we'll learn that... The Big Empty lived up to its name. A hollow crater of failures of a past era. A last sad statement of the old world. In the time following the Second Battle of Hoover Dam, Old World Blues became more than a catchphrase. It became a reality, a withering form of nostalgia for times long past. It can be easy to see science as evil, technology unchecked as the source of all ills, all misfortunes. With the courier at the helm, it was all this and more. Old World Blues, New World Misery. The two became one in the courier shadow. But if we completed the DLC with good or neutral karma, we learned that... In the times following the Second Battle of Hoover Dam, however, Old World Blues took on a new meaning. Where once it was viewed as a form of sadness, nostalgia, it became an expression describing the potential for the future. It can be easy to see science as evil, technology unchecked as the source of all ills, all misfortunes. With the courier at the helm, science became a beacon for the future. There was old world blues, and new world hope, and hope ruled the day at Big Mountain. We could say more, but the stories in the Big Empty speak for themselves. Now armed with the transportal ponder, the courier could return to the dome at any time and crack open the secrets of the Big Empty one by one. The sink sat vigilant, waiting for its master to return. Shoes covered in Mojave dust. Only one road yet remained. And it was one the courier had to walk alone. And when we returned to the sink, if we chose to take our brain with us, our brain is placed back in our skull, swapping the brainless perk for the big brained perk, which I covered in my video on the Autodoc. We also gain a new item. You've acquired the Big Mountain Transportal Ponder. It's capable of transporting you and you alone between the Mojave Wasteland and Big Mountain. To return to the Mojave or to go back to Big Mountain from the Mojave, simply equip the Transportal Ponder as you would any weapon. Pull the trigger and away you'll go. Note that it won't work in interiors or in combat situations and is totally incapable of harming your enemies. And when we return to the sink... <laughs> Uh, 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 to say otherwise, uh, I remind uh, sir, that it is a waste room. Is is someone still cheering? Is that you, Jefferson? <laughs> Any more? <laughs> Well, I'm glad he's happy. Like the think tank scientists, most of the appliances have a unique response after confronting the think tank. I trust matters regarding your brain were resolved to your satisfaction. I understand you're to be congratulated on the recovery of your missing organs. Bravo. With the brains dealt with soon, we can spread our rule across the Mojave. All will eat burned toast in despair. You outbrained the big brains? That is so hot. 
Might I be safe in the assumption that matters with the think tank had been satisfactorily computed vis-a-vis -vis your residence in this domicile? Mmm, you took care of brains pretty good, baby. Nice. You're back, and the brains didn't lobotomize you. Well, not any worse, at least. Hooray! Please, 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 tell me you stomped Dr. Rose's brain into a fine paste. Did he squeal? Did he beg? God, I hope he begged. Who's the flatware bitch now, ho? So you beat the big brains at their own game, huh? Guess you'll be putting your walking shoes on again. Hitting that old, lonesome road. If we chose to leave our brain, it appears in a jar at the sink. Nice to see you back. I trust the adventuring is going well. Barring the unlikely event that I evolve some sort of rocket-propelled locomotion, I will be here. He'll stay here as long as we want, or we can always use the autodoc to put him back in our skull. And if we kept Dr. Mobius alive, he becomes a daily source of free Mintats. Why, of course you can. I am well versed in the science of sharing. Well, when not chemmed out of my sphere. And from him we learn something troubling about the other visitors. When we ask him if he knows anything else about them, he says... Uh, not much, except they contaminated Big Mountain and installed new ideas in the think tank. One caused a great deal of infrastructure damage with his brain and smartiness. Ruthless, that one, played a little rough with the trains. But the last one was the most dangerous. Him eh, slipping away. That was almost as bad as the think tank escaping. What do you mean? The first one, the ruthless one who smashed up our toy trains, asked for weapons, power, items he could use to destroy a nation with force. The other, the other asked a different question, and with it got the true answer about what makes nations and what breaks them. He spoke to the think tank to climb, showed them the flag of the old world, and it made them remember all of it. All that had happened. They shared things with him that they shouldn't. He now carries those ideas, that knowledge, elsewhere. Ulysses. The other must have been Ulysses. He asked a question about what makes nations and what breaks them, and he got a true answer. What kind of information was it? Perhaps we will find out if, as Blind Dio Jefferson said, we ever travel that lonesome road. Once we are ready, we can equip the Transportal Ponder. It looks like a pistol, but it doesn't do any damage. It does, however, look really neat. As we learned, however, it does not work inside, so when we are ready, we have to head outside to activate the Transportal Ponder. And with that, we reappear back at the Mojave Drive-In. The crashed satellite still wiggles, but we can no longer interact with it. And the projection is gone from the screen. It looks like no more innocent people will stumble upon the big mountain and get ruthlessly lobotomized by the scientists. This means that the Transportal Ponder is now the only way in or out. We are effectively masters of Big Mountain. So which of these endings is the best one? Well, from a purely materialistic perspective, it's better to leave everyone alive. Doing so allows us to collect free mentats, caps, body parts, magazines, and ammunition every day. But what about morals? Is it ethical to leave the think tank alive? And what about Mobius? He's nearly as crazy as they are. Is it more ethical to destroy Mobius? To just make the crater a simpler place? Remove all of these floating brains in jars. Well, this is a bit tricky due to the nature of the think tank scientists. If they were still human and their minds had not been affected by 200 years of degradation inside their biogel, I would say that the think tank scientists need to see justice. They did unspeakable, horrible evils to the inmates at Little Yang Z, and they ruthlessly lobotomized people who innocently stumbled upon their satellite and got transported to the Big Empty. Dr. Mobius recognized the danger of his 
friends, which is why he hacked them, reprogrammed them, put them in a perpetual loop, and harassed them with robo-scorpions. But I think even Dr. Mobius made a mistake. After all, he attacked the courier with his robo-scorpions too, and the courier was an innocent party. Through his own negligence, he left the giant robo-scorpion active, which we had to fight through to talk to him. How many people who innocently made their way here to Big Empty died from Dr. Mobius's robo-scorpions? We know that most were lobotomized by the think tank, but not all. If you use the sonic emitter to get rid of the barrier on the balcony to the sink, you can hop down on top of the dome. If you walk straight away from the door to the sink all the way down, on one of the concrete platforms, we find the body of a follower of the apocalypse, Julie Farkas's crowd. This follower is not lobotomized, still has all of his or her own gear. This raises a few questions. How did this follower escape without becoming lobotomized? And how did the follower get here without removing the barrier? But those questions aside, if this follower could have escaped from the think tank without being lobotomized, if Elijah, Christine, and Ulysses could have escaped without becoming lobotomized. How many others made their way here without being lobotomized, only to meet their end, not only by the horrors found here, but also by Dr. Mobius's Robo-Scorpions? Robo-Scorpions he didn't mean to program to attack everyone, but through his negligence, that's exactly what they do. And his master plan to distract the think tank scientists ultimately allowed them to download the schematics for everything they needed to escape the crater. The world would certainly be safer if all of the Think Tank and Dr. Mobius were dead. But we do have an option to effectively neuter everybody, to make the Think Tank completely ineffective, to stop the flow of new people stumbling into Big Mountain to become lobotomized. We have the option to make Big Mountain a self-contained place where the scientists can do no harm. Because their brains have degraded so much over the years, and because they had been hacked, reprogrammed by Dr. Mobius, and in Dr. Eight's case, also by Father Elijah. At this point in their lives, I don't think I could call them human. They lost whatever humanity they had long ago. Even when we take great steps to remind them of that humanity, they only get close to it. They never actually embrace it. We can satisfy a few of Dr. Dalla's human urges, but they're not real human urges. They're uniquely twisted. They would only satisfy a strange robot in a jar, not a normal human being. For a brief moment, Dr. Boris has an inkling of his past humanity and expresses a bit of regret. But then his recursive programming kicks back in, and he becomes the exact same creature he was before. Because of this, I really don't think ethics and morality play in this particular story. We wouldn't be having a conversation about ethics between rampaging Deathclaw packs, for example. Deathclaws are animals. They're doing what they do by instinct. We have to fight them. We have to destroy them. But we also really can't blame them. And that's the approach I'll take with these scientists. We have to oppose these scientists to save ourselves and to save the Mojave. But we also can't really blame them. They're doing what they've been programmed to do. I don't know at this point in their life if they could even do anything different. So it's neither moral nor immoral to either destroy them or leave them alive. It's ultimately up to the fancies of the courier. In my game, I chose to leave them alive simply because that was the most beneficial option for me. I can still get free stuff from them whenever I visit. Plus, I think they're funny. But that's just my opinion, and I'd love to know your thoughts. What did you choose to do in your game? Do you think morality and ethics play here? Should these half-thinking robots pay for the sins that they and their bodies committed when they were fully functioning humans? Or is it wrong to kill these creatures, despite what they did in the past? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. This video wraps up my series on Old World Blues. I had so much fun going through this DLC and inspecting every corner, lifting up every rock. I typically end my DLC series with a big episode focused on the loot, but I did something a little bit differently this time. I went through every achievement, every challenge, and every piece of loot weapons, armor, and consumables as we came upon them in the game. So I don't feel like I need to make another episode dedicated to the loot. But as always, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on it. If you feel strongly that I need a big loot episode to end this series, let me know in the comments below. This DLC was challenging to make a series about, but that's just a testament to how amazing these developers were at creating such a compelling story. Would a DLC like this be made today? It was so creative filled with things that are mad, absolutely ridiculous on paper, but managed to work just fine in this 
crazy world. I appreciate the fact that Obsidian loved cheesy old science fiction movies so much that they effectively used this DLC to write a love letter to them. Old World Blues is so unique, really unlike anything else we could ever play. That makes Old World Blues one of the most memorable and enjoyable DLCs I've played in the Fallout franchise. While we may be done with Old World Blues, there is still so much more lore to cover. I still have many more DLCs to complete for Fallout 3. There's still a slew of content yet to make for Fallout 4. And of course, we have one final DLC to explore for Fallout New Vegas. Our next task is to meet a man from our past at the end of the Lonesome Road. If you want to make sure that you don't miss that series when I come to it, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I have some new shirts in the shop, folks. In light of this series, I figured I would have some shirts for each of the Think Tank scientists. You can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you joined me for this long but rewarding series. Old World Blues may be over, but I'll have a brand new video for you as always, bright and early, tomorrow morning.